What's up, NHL fans? What a wild Monday night it was last night in the NHL. Every team that needed to win to stay alive did. The Pittsburgh Penguins, the Detroit Red Wings, the Washington Capitals, the New York Rangers clinched their President's Trophy, which I'm not going to brag about too much this morning, but tonight's going to be even more interesting because the Red Wings play again, the Capitals play again. We have so many different scenarios that could happen, and we're going to welcome on Frank Saravelli in about 15 minutes, but before we do that, Alongside Kobe Cohen, I'm Johnny Lazarus. This is Morning Cup of Hockey, presented by Betway. If you're going to place a bet, bet on Betway. Please play responsibly, and remember, you must be 19 years of age or older. Kobe's got his salmon out west sweater on. He's looking glorious this morning. It's not a, a sweater. Morning. It's a sweatshirt. Sweatshirt. Sorry. It's a hoodie. There's a hoodie. hood. Sweater hoodie. would mean, like, some, you know, weird Easter sweater. Okay. Well, how's your morning going, pal? Let me ask you a question that I'm just going to hit you with right off the top. I don't want you to ask me anything. What, as a Rangers super fan, even though you're also a part-time Islanders fan. The, the correct term is jock sniffer. What you are. You are jock <laughs> that's, what, that's, what, that's what Merles and Kobe Armstrong call me. <laughs> they do? Yeah. <laughs> it's such a good name for you. You are. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. I shouldn't Thank have told you, you guys. that. I, I love that. <laughs> but um, who do you want as a Rangers fan to get into wild card to? Like, who's um, the most favorable or most entertaining matchup for you as a super fan? Well, most entertaining, I think, but the most nervous I would be would be the Penguins. Um, you know, seeing Sid and, and knowing what the Penguins have done to the Rangers in previous years and kind of that um, payback for 2022 and – Truba hits Crosby and the Rangers come back from down three to one and winning game seven. And, you know, they're playing against Louis Domingue and Jari wasn't healthy and all these different factors in that series. I think for entertainment value, that would probably be the the best matchup, but that's the one that I would fear most. I, I think the best matchup though for the Rangers would be the Red Wings. Um, I just, they, they have a lot of offensive firepower. Sure. But I don't think their blue line is deep enough to stop the Rangers. Um, they've had their way with Alex this Lyon period. doesn't, uh, doesn't give yeah. you the shakes. No, I'm taking just over. I mean, not that uh, Sam Erson does in Philly, but you know, after watching the Rangers play Philly the other day, it, it made me just a little bit worried about the flyers. I don't, I don't know why, but um, we've I'd got say a lot of, we have a lot of interesting comments already yeah, in the chat. Going right to we're, it. We're going to get to them early. First of all, I, I see all the disc, you know, the comments about the salmon sweatshirt. Okay. And I just want to tell you this sweatshirt um, is from out West, which is one of our show sponsors. Mm. And they sent us a blue one and a salmon one. And I did complain to Johnny and I was like, do you think you could ask them to send me like a gray or a black one or a white or, you know, like, I don't <laughs> I really think it looks wear, good. Listen, I don't really wear light colors. It's not really my thing. Um, the reason I am wearing this is because I wore the blue one. And I and it's so comfortable. It is yeah. like it's you're I'll be honest, it is not my favorite color, but I've actually worn it and I've even worn it in public um because it's so comfortable. So not my favorite color. You're not wrong thinking you would never see me in a color like this for the most part, but mm -hmm. look, it's it's lightweight and it's very comfortable. So um the other funny comment was Johnny's a puck bunny, which I yeah, think no, is, funny. is probably <laughs> It's, it's probably a pretty accurate term. I think that, um, you know, hey, whatever you're into, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. like this is 2024. So do your thing, Johnny. Let me um, let me clarify one thing in the chat, though. I don't fear any team in the first round. Okay. It was just me answering the question. Do you like, fear the Islanders? I think I think the Rangers beat the Penguins in six games. I think they beat Detroit in five. I think they beat Philly in five. And I think they'd beat Washington in five too. Honestly, Pittsburgh's the only one that I think it would it would go past five games. Um, no, I don't fear the Islanders either. Yeah, I mean, look, I think the Rangers have have given you every reason to be confident. Yeah, there's there's one team in the yeah. East that I fear, and that is the Tampa Bay Lightning. That's the only team that I would say. All right, well, let's go. Let's get into yeah. our our Pro Rosso playoff preview. Let's just start with that because that's where we're at. I mean, th th it's wild what's going on right now. Yeah, so we're going to have Frank dive in deeper a little bit with all the scenarios and tiebreakers and whatnot, but this is our Parasso playoff preview presented by Parasso, which is 
the company will be using to help with my playoff beard. I don't know. Should I shave fresh? Like no. before I start, it. start now? Ride it. Right now. Go with yes. this. Ride How, it. Do haircuts work? Nope. No. I'd ride it. Ride the I'm whole going thing. going full caveman? Yep. All right. Well, then uh, we're going to have to put the pause on the dating life. But uh, this is presented by Parasso, the most complete choice for shaving and beard care made in Italy since 1948. Parasso has been a staple of Italian culture and barbershops globally for four generations. Get 15% off at parasso usacom with our promo code HOCKEY15 in all caps. HOCKEY15. I'm going to have to get a haircut. No? I think your hair looks good, bud. Yeah, but it's going to get... How about this? We're talking about three months. How about this? Hockey. Grow it out until the Rangers lose. If the Rangers lose, you can get a haircut. How about that? Yeah, that's fair. I'll do that. That seems reasonable. Yeah, that seems reasonable. That's fair. And you're going to grow your playoff beard. Um... You're gonna use your 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 beard supplies from Pro Rosso, mm-hmm. right? Did mm-hmm. we ever get word if there was Pro Rosso um, goodies sent to Jeremiah? Did we ever get word on that? I emailed them with Jeremiah's address. He was kind enough to share his address with me, and uh, which I guess is I'll fair because we, yeah. we shared we shared a phone number, yeah. so you could share an address. That's fair. Uh- I'll have to follow up with them. So Jeremiah, um, I mean, I his beard is yet. like Joe. It's like Joe Thornton level. I mean, I saw it in person uh, at the Frozen Four. I mean, that's some <laughs> Joe Thornton type of shit right there. Mm-hmm. I'm getting comments now. Johnny Peach Fuzz, <laughs> uh, Pizza Sports Guy. Johnny fears Patrick Kane in the wings after those comments. Um, I don't fear the wings. I, I the Kane thing is, it's kind of, dude. People like hate me because of that um that's but, not the reason people hate you. oh yeah there's 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 more reasons yeah there's more reasons but which game for you i mean i think the obvious answer is detroit uh montreal last night lane hudson obviously you were paying attention to the beautiful boy but how crazy was that game everyone in the press box last night was going nuts just scoreboard watching yeah so i was bouncing around last night probably more than normal so i was like getting a p pe- a period of this game a period of that game but i i did watch the first you know first 20 minutes of that game uh the red wings came out lifeless like they looked like they were halfway to cabo on their on their boys trip when the season ended i mean it was as bad a start as it could be um yeah, Lane Hudson grabs that point early in the game. Very kind of vintage blue line play by Lane Hudson. But did he get the point? Because I I, I heard that he wasn't rewarded with the assist. No, he got an assist. He yeah, did? he did. Okay. Yeah, I mean, he made the whole play along the blue line. He took a shot on Ned, and then um, who banged in the rebound in front? I can't remember who banged in the rebound. But no, was no, Evans that was there? an ass- that was an assist, and that was a uh, uh, a primary assist. So. Um, you know, that, that, that game was, was, was bizarre because, uh, it was Gallagher who scored the goal. That's right. Yeah. So, um, the fact that Detroit came back, um, makes all those plays late, you know, Lucas Raymond, a couple of goals, Shane Gostasphere, the plays that he made to get his team that win kind of funny, to be honest, like when you think about the poetic justice of it all. The Philadelphia Flyers were sitting there like probably celebrating that Detroit loss, right? Mm Because things looked a little bit cleaner and a little bit easier for the Flyers if Detroit loses that game last night. And then Shane Gossesphere, a guy that they basically had to pay, not basically, they had to pay Arizona, bribe Arizona to take Shane Gossesphere. And and he just, with a couple of absolute killer plays uh, late in that hockey game, um, you know, to help his team look at the air and the little backhand play to Perron. I mean, like that was an athletic freaking play, you know, to be made. And then, you know, that play kind of rolls around and Raymond gets the tying goal and Ken Daniels just absolutely nailed the call. When we got on our pre-production call this morning, that was like one of the first things Johnny said to me was who, who's the guy who does the who calls the Red Wings. And I'm like, yeah, big time call by Ken Daniels. Just absolutely nailed it. I was people, in fired up. Are, people in Detroit are pretty lucky to have that guy calling local their local games. Like he's, he's really good. So, I mean, look, winning the way they won last night, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking the Detroit Red Wings are winning another hockey game. Like I, I really do like they're, uh, 
they 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 had a major come to Jesus like last few minutes of that hockey game and then the overtime like I mean you couldn't be feeling any better about yourselves going into game 82. Mm -hmm. And Jeremiah just said uh now Philly basically can't make it. Um or, well, that's or not true. Almost impossible. But yeah, it, I mean that's that's not true. I mean, look, the Flyers are still They alive. just need a lot of help. Yeah, look, they're 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 their destiny or their destiny is not in their own hands. Um, you know, the Rangers clinch the presidents, Detroit gets the comeback, and then you've got Washington who completely locks Boston down. You know, the first period, I watched the first period of that game off and on. I didn't and see any of that. More game. in the second period. I mean, they were completely out shooting the Bruins. The Bruins, they didn't really show up last night. Like I to me, I think the Bruins would be happy to lose their next game as well and play Toronto in the first round. Well, they've got um, Ottawa tonight. You think they're going to, you know, who knows? Maybe yeah. they, maybe, maybe some of their, their guys don't play. Like, I, I don't really know what the, what the game plan is there, but it's kind of how it looked. Um, you know, Pittsburgh keeps rolling along and beats Nashville. And so basically nobody got eliminated last night. So now you go into game 82 with a number of scenarios. Um, Teams who can get to 90 points um, and teams that can, you know, get to 89 points. Um, you know, it, it's Detroit can obviously get to 91. Washington can get to 91. Um, so, so those two teams would have the, you know, would have the edge there if they both win in regulation. But um, it, it's like when you're a schedule maker, you got to be sitting there like, yeah smirking your face yeah. off right now because game 82 matters for one, two, three, four, for four teams to try to get in. And then it matters for teams around the top because there's still, you know, the top team. Cause it's like, okay, well, who are we getting? Right. I mean, this is kind of mm -hmm. what you'd hope for in a, in a season finale. Well, you asked me and now let me ask you what results do you want to see and who do you want to see get that second spot? Because I still I still want that Penguins game to somehow mean something tomorrow night against the Islanders. Vic, put the uh put the standings back up. So So you got the Capitals and the uh Flyers tonight, Red Wings and Canadians tonight, Islanders, Penguins tomorrow night. Right. So if 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 the Caps win or Detroit wins, then the Flyers and obviously Pitt the philly and pittsburgh are out um well, caps then, win they're in it's over yeah because the caps go to 91 and they have mm -hmm. more regulation wins yeah, yeah. exactly so so you're the basically caps are the only team that can just win and, and be in so you're rooting for a caps loss tonight is what you're telling me i'm rooting for a caps loss tonight All right so he here's what i would say who do i'm not I saying want i want the win? penguins to win tomorrow i just want that game to mean something as far as who i want to win tomorrow i'm i'm kind of thinking that the the penguins would have the best chance to be tough against the rangers i think you know crosby brings a different element um you know i know nadelkovich has been good but like he's still nadelkovich <laughs> for la for lack of a better way what to was put that it was a creepy ass laugh <laughs> um i mean cuz it's like i'm kind of taking a shot at the guy but yeah. it's just a I've never heard you laugh like that before i don't think i don't think detroit puts up much of a fight in the first round um, I think the Flyers would actually put up a better fight in the first round of the playoffs than than Detroit would. Um, you know, but again, like you just you can't you can't really discount the way Washington battled their way back into it late down the season. Ovi gets, you know, up to 30 plus goals. Like there's still a lot of juice there. Lindgren, he can get hot. Um, I think it's probably Pittsburgh for me. If, if, if I'm, you know, I'd like to see them creep into that eighth spot for the, for the competitive reason of, I think a Rangers penguins first round would do really well. It would rate really well. It would probably have ABC Saturday, you know, game times or, or, or Sunday. Well, I guess Sunday's a TNT day, but, um, you know, I just think that would be better TV, better entertainment. And I think Crosby of, of all the superstars, Crosby's been the best one of the stars amongst those teams, right? I mean, yeah. I don't think that's really a debatable thing. I know Ovi got to 30, but Crosby was at a better level than Ovechkin was throughout this season. So yeah, that, that's that's cool. probably what I would like to see. Okay, so now let me ask you this question too. I know we kind of touched on it a little bit yesterday, but didn't really get into detail. Do you think any team will rest any players for game 82? 
Like, if you are Boston tonight, would you rest guys against Ottawa? You know who no? I would rest? I would not put Leon Dreisaitl or I would not play Leon Dreisaitl McDavid. or Connor McDavid. Yeah. Um, they, I think they play in Arizona. They're going to Arizona, yeah. And you've got McDavid, who who was just out with, with like, a day-to-day -day type of injury. And he got his 100th assist. Just let him sit. He got right? the 100th point. Like, why not get him five days off before mm – -hmm you know, you basically need him to carry you through the next two and a half months. I mean, you know, the way he plays, the pace that he plays at, I'd probably look to rest those guys. I might even look to the back end in in um, in Edmonton and and get, you know, Bouchard a night, Nurse a night, um, you know, give Holloway a little more ice time. He's played pretty good here down the stretch for Edmonton, you know, and, and you look at some of the teams in the West. I mean, there, there's probably, I mean, look, if you're Dallas, like, do you really need to play your big, do you need to play Miro Haskin in? I mean, you, no. you locked up the West, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, well, I guess let's see here. Who's got 80 games left. Can anybody catch them? Yeah. I guess Vancouver could, uh, regulation wins. Yeah. So I guess if Vancouver were to win out and Dallas loses, they could fall down a spot. So, um, you know, I, to me, like, I, I think getting guys a little bit of extra rest now that things have kind of settled in a little bit more, if your team's at the top, I, I wouldn't be completely against that. You know, if, if, if you get a guy four to five days off compared to only, let's say two, I think that makes a big difference when a series starts to push into game six and seven. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, now that the Islanders and Canes know they're playing each other, wouldn't be surprised to see those two teams sit guys for their last game. Right. Like I know we well, I feel like you were kind of against it yesterday, but now that things are a little bit settled in, are you you're more open to that? Well, now that now that I think things are settled in, yeah. I, I don't have an issue with it. I think when you're trying to settle things and playoff matchups still matter. You're talking about, you know, feeling good going into the playoffs. Right. And, and, um, and I think a lot of that I think a lot of that still exists, but we're talking about the teams at the top that are all, you know, most of them are playing pretty well. Um, I, mean, I think Frank. the Islanders have, have actually, I mean, they've, they've taken care of business. Like they're the only team at the bottom of the Metro that, that once it wasn't house money um, and just like, Oh, we can play free and easy right now because we're out. They actually stepped it up and they actually, um, you know, won these games down the stretch. They did it without Noah Dobson, who's their best, mm -hmm. best player guy on the back end yeah their power play has been absolutely fucking dreadful um but you know it, it it's 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 probably to the point where yeah if, if one game off buys you like an extra three days off i think that that's that's probably well worth it for teams that have guys that play heavy minutes jeremiah called us crosby jock sniffers <laughs> i mean it's a mount rushmore guy right um but trying to think what okay so uh with the islanders too there's a lot of islander fans like you know zach bryan i think went into ubs arena and sang the song i guess Rev i'm not a zach bryan fan but i guess he has a song revival and he sang that song at ubs and like the islanders went seven one and oh ever since he performed so uh you know all these jokes like the predators skipping you two that got them back into the playoffs and the islanders are going to rely on zach bryan and whatnot i <laughs> You you probably think, think the, Preds, the, goofy, like you think the Preds are a threat to win a playoff series? Who are they lined up to play against in the first round? Pick, give us Western. Give us Western. That's the well, other thing that Vancouver. that's not settled yet because you know you kind of look at Vegas. Vegas should jump LA now. LA has one game left. Vegas has two, and they're one point back. So then that pushes LA back down. But then 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 let's see. Regulation wins thirty eight. LA thirty seven. So. Actually, it looks like Nashville would be locked into that that wild card one spot. Yeah, LA um, would end up playing Dallas. Right. So so then Nashville's looking at probably either yeah, they're looking at Vancouver. That that mm -hmm. you know, that looks I think Nashville close, could win. Pretty close to happening. Yeah, That's I mean, look, I, I I don't think that they're gonna beat um, I don't, I don't foresee Nashville beating Vancouver in the first round. I think Vancouver, I don't see Vancouver going on a long run, but I, I don't, uh, I don't see that happening in the first round. So 
Let's get to Frank. Uh, mm -hmm. He just joined us here in the waiting room. So let's bring him in. I'm kind of dying to ask him for updates on the Arizona situation because that just continues to be such a shit show. And as things start to uh, unravel a little bit and we hear people's commentary. So are you guys uh, good? Morning, though, Frank, you what's going on? What'd you, you say? Good? Are, are you and Colby good, Frank, after yesterday with Colby's hashtag sources and, and all this stuff going on from Colby's Twitter account? Colby's wannabe insider move? I don't <laughs> yeah. think I, I wrote hashtag sources. I think you did with Rucker. I'm pretty sure. No, I didn't we say might, hashtag sources. Try again. Have to find that tweet. It's not I'm hard to find. It it's pretty clear, pretty close to the top of my timeline. Yeah, I mean, know. look, if you're going to come for the big dog, you got to bring something <laughs> better than that. Nobody's coming for for any inciting big dog. Uh, Can't work. even take myself seriously saying that. Um, okay, not hashtag, but it's sources tell me we can expect news on the decision from Go Jets. Well, let Go me ask you a question, Johnny. <laughs> who do you think my source on those situations are? We all know who. Look, your we don't talk about are. sources. That's the number one rule in the game. <laughs> Stop. We're turning this into a, a insider lesson for Kobe. Say no. Save yourself. Okay. <laughs> um, Frank. I want to talk. I want to start with the Arizona situation and and see if there's sort of an really? update on on the time frame, uh, any new potential information, and then I kind of want to go a little deeper into what uh, some folks have been saying about the whole situation. So okay. I'll give you the floor, and I'm I'm curious like where we're at with this whole uh, Phoenix Coyote Utah whatever we're gonna call it situation. The Utah Yeti. As long as it's not Yetis, plural, if they go down that path. Um, look, in all seriousness, uh, they're closing in on a done, sealed, signed agreement. The terms have all been agreed to. Uh, I'm told that um, they're working feverishly around the clock to get to a point where this is something that they can formally and officially announce this week. Uh, there's reason to do so, uh, even though Arizona Coyotes fans know what's coming. Ideally, they'd like to have Ryan Smith be able to present to the team or at least meet them and talk to them before they have their exit interviews and go their separate ways into the offseason. Um, it's not a sales pitch from him. It's more of just, hey, this is what we, we'd like to build. Uh, he's apparently a very charismatic guy. And they want to get him in front of the players so that everyone feels good heading into the offseason. Um, there was a report in Sportico yesterday that the NHL's executive committee, which is the smaller form of the Board of Governors, the most powerful 10 owners in the league, had already voted to approve this so it could advance to the next step, which is the full uh, Board of Governors approval. So that's also required. Um, just think about the paperwork involved you know, you know what it's like trying to buy a house. Now try and swap a billion dollar franchise um, and involve all sorts of, uh, you know, transactions to make it happen um, and send the team to a different place. There's a lot involved. So uh, they're working hard on it. And it's, I don't have any doubt at this point that it's going to come to fruition and completion. It's really just a matter of time. Um, like Frank, some news. Yeah. as, as this is coming in, I don't know if you want to, if you want to look down at your phone and, and, <laughs> and, uh, see what's going on. I, I I'm seeing on, on Twitter right now, yeah. Frank, um, that the Buffalo Sabres have relieved, uh, head coach Don Granado of his job. I don't know if, uh, that's something, um, we thought was happening today by any stretch of an imagination. Yep. Uh, so the news is uh, the Sabres tweeting it out this morning uh, that they fired coach Don Granato, assistant coach Jason Christie and video coordinator, Matt Smith. Um, I'm surprised. And the reason for that is Don Granato was a huge part of that team trending in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at this team and I feel like the last thing they needed was another coaching change. They've been through a bunch and yeah, I know they haven't gotten the results, but to me, I pin their lack of success this season and being one of those teams that was so close to making the playoffs last year to this absolute pillow fight. The Sabres had 91 points last year. 
The cut line to get into the playoffs today, 91 would guarantee you a spot. The fact that the Sabres weren't able to take even a small step forward to 92 is incredibly disappointing. And I place the blame for that, not on the coaching staff, but really on roster construction. They made a bunch of big bets, Kevin Adams and his front office, on young players to really go out and seize it. Starting in goal with Devin Levi, they ended up with another young goalie in Uka Pekalukanen taking the reins and running with it. And he was really kind of a revelation this season. So you're thinking they're pretty set in goal moving forward. Their back end, to me, they're uniquely well positioned to, I think, to be a playoff team and, and in fact, be a cup contender at some point in the next handful of years with Power, Daleen, Samuelson, and now Bo and Byram. But up front, it can't, you, it can't all be on Tage Thompson. It can't all be on... Whoever Alex the next Tuck. group is, Alex Tuck, Alex Tuck yeah. or JJ Paterka, mm -hmm. that team is not big enough. They were pushed around, and they're definitely not deep enough. So I don't look at that and and say, you know what, it's coaching. That's what's holding them back. I look at Don Granado and and I say, that's a guy that came in and galvanized this team. He made players want to be in Buffalo. This is going to be an interesting move. Yeah, I'm and trying Frank, to see what Sabres fans are saying about it. Did, didn't his contract extension not even kick in? Wasn't that set to kick in this summer, if I remember correctly, based on when he signed it? I know I'm, I'm, you're trying to juggle probably 30 GM contracts in your head right now, but I'm, I'm almost positive that he signed an extension that was due to kick in um, in this off season, and I wonder how that works legally and and we may need like a contract lawyer to ask this question but if you're to sign a contract extension and it hasn't kicked in yet before you got fired you get paid in full. That, what'd you say you get paid in full okay so there wouldn't be a way where the team could say look we never even nope. got to this point no once you sign it it's a new employment contract that's guaranteed so, gotcha. so it, the they're date, on the hook for 1.9 million for each of the next two seasons for Don Granado, which again, um, it's not about the money. Terry Pagula has plenty of money. It's, it's about getting it right. And my, my thought process here is okay. On to another one. I mean, just go through the coaches that the Sabres have had and look, not all of that is on, is on Kevin Adams, but well, Frank, I'm seeing a lot of comments under their tweets saying, bring Lindy back. Like Lindy Ruff, bring her. I mean, absolute uh, insanity. Yeah. Insanity. I mean, so this is, so just, just run through the last. Uh, so since Lindy Ruff was fired 11 years ago, Ron Rolston, Ted Nolan, Dan Bilesma, Phil Housley, Ralph Kruger, Don Granado. Yeah. That's a ton. Yeah, no, it's and and I remember Ron Ralston kind of kind of lucked into the job. I mean, I played for Ron. He was the assistant coach in I mean, he was the coach in Rochester and and somebody I can't remember whoever got fired and he kind of got it as a, you know, he was interim and then they didn't know what to do and and I do know that Buffalo is very high on their Rochester head coach Seth Appert. I do know that for a fact. Um I also know that David Carl at 34 years old just won his second national championship mm -hmm. and was on the bench for three national championships in the last whatever since 2017 because he was with Jim Montgomery. I doubt they'll be able to get David Carl. I really do. Not saying they even would want him. I'm just saying I don't think they could get him. I think oh, a yeah, team's gonna yeah, have well, to he pay, want that. I think a team's gonna have to pay David Carl a lot of money to get him to leave Denver. He makes a lot of money at Denver. He's in a great situation. He's not in a rush to join the pro ranks for for quality of life unless he gets a team that's legitimate. Which we are saying Buffalo is a good could be a good situation, but I don't think they're willing to pony up the money to get him to leave Denver. But certainly interesting with on the heels of everybody talking about David Carl um, for this Buffalo job to, to become open. And then on top of it, like I said, I would not be shocked if, if well, look, I'm not going to say I wouldn't be shocked. Like they will give Seth Appert an interview, their American league head coach. He will get an interview, mm -hmm. whether he's 
a legitimate candidate or not. That's Frank's department. That's, that's more not than my the department. discussion for today. I don't think. I mean, look, we're always trying to advance it forward. Rasmus Dahlin next year is going to play his seventh year in the NHL. And he's the Sabres elder statesman. He's the only one left from 2018, 19. Next year is going to be his fourth head coach in seven years. Yeah, it's crazy. Do you think a big part of this too, Frank, is just a lot of the outside noise surrounding Buffalo going into this year where, you know, this seemed like it was the season that they were the sexy team to make the playoffs. When you talked about the Buffalo, Ottawa, Detroit teams that were on the come up, everyone was, you know, everyone in the media that is, um, was pushing for Buffalo. And because of that disappointment, just from outside of the room, you have to make a change. Do you think a lot of this changes because of that? Um, I've think think you talk about roster construction and, and Kevin Adams has been pretty immune to the outside noise. So I can't imagine that now all of a sudden he's quaking in his boots and is making this decision based off of that. It must be an honest assessment on his part that he believes coaching has been part of the reason that's held them back mm-hmm. that plain and simple, but GMs generally don't get more than two coaches. So I feel like this just started his clock. A hundred percent. It did this. This, this, this just, Don Granato was a Kevin Adams hire. So right. this is now squarely on him. Mm-hmm. And so I, I have a name that I wanted to throw out too. who look, I think is be thrown in the this mix is a great, here. I think this He's is done a great, great job with the Rangers. Now. I don't Pekka. know if we just we, I we think, might yeah, just, I think I froze up for a second. Oh, I've got me back no, now. I think it was Johnny. We we lost you for a second, Johnny. But you got me now. Um, did you hear I said? Go ahead, ask your question. We didn't. I, no, didn't I was going to say a, a name that I think could be thrown in the mix for that Buffalo job could be Michael Pekka. I mean, maybe look. Yeah. I, I think there are. This is a great time to hire head coaches. Uh, one. There's probably only one. There's, a, I mean, there's a couple interim jobs, of course. Drew Bannister in St. Louis, Jim Hiller in LA, and Jacques Martin in Ottawa. But I think there's tons of good coaches to go around uh, that have been put on the firing block, uh, firing line. Uh, you've got Jay Woodcroft, you've got Craig Berube, you've got Todd McClellan. Um, there's a whole host of guys that are available that have Todd McClellan <laughs> success. What, what, dude, I think Todd, you laugh. I think Todd McClellan is one of the five best coaches in the NHL. And you know what? If he went to Buffalo, he'd be the first guy to get them to play defense. No doubt about that. But I laugh because he, he, he's going to, he is, he's going to get another head coaching job and it's going to be what his fifth team, right? But and why? It, it, why shouldn't he? Everywhere he goes, he's had success. Has he but, won a cup though? No, he no, has right? Not won he has cup. Yeah. So, um, it just honestly, it, it's it's almost just a laugh out of like we talk about recycling people over and over again. Yeah. And look, if you're Buffalo, you probably don't want someone inexperienced. You've been he down took, that road. He took with- a rebuilding Oilers team with Connor McDavid. Fine, he's the first guy to get them to the playoffs. He took a rebuilding Kings team and got them into the playoffs twice. What more do you want? Yeah. What about Joel Quinville? That's, that's I just another saw that name. in the chat. Yeah. That's another name that I think you'd have to consider, uh, provided that if and only if he reinstated. receives reinstatement from the NHL. Um, that I think is a huge talking point and should be because look, say whatever you want about Joel Quinville. Um, whether you think he's the devil reincarnate or whether you think he's been someone who's been a scapegoat or if you fall somewhere in the middle, my biggest issue with what Joel Quenville and Stan Bowman are facing from the NHL is that they haven't received any sentence at all. Even the worst criminals that get locked away and you throw away the key, at least they know they're in there forever. Yeah. I'm with you on this. I I think that's totally unfair that now three full years, three full years of hockey after this report was released, that they've been out of work and unable to earn a living in the field, that they don't have any clarity on their situation. And it's just, uh, eh, we'll get to you when we get to you thing. Well, look, it's the NHL's private enterprise. It's their own business. They can do whatever they want. But first off, you know, we, we need to have a a serious and difficult societal discussion and an uncomfortable conversation about this topic, number one. 
And number two, um, regardless of where you stand on it, at some point, these people that, and Joel Quenville admitted, Cam and Strick podcast, yeah, I a to couple that as well. last week it was, mm -hmm. that he made mistakes. But at some point, you're punishing these people more than the actual abuser yeah. himself. And I think and, that's and another question, another uncomfortable conversation we need I, to have. I think, I think that's really well put. And just having worked in Chicago for two years and learning about the dynamic of the organization, John McDonough was, was, was a dictator in the way that he ran that organization. So while these guys all made mistakes, yeah, where did that, where did that rat scurry off to? That's what I'm saying. Cause like, he never John, participated in the investigation and no one's ever heard from him again. And, he, and there's and been he got no to keep, repercussion for him. And he got to keep his like $6 million and continue to get paid. So whatever it was that he was getting paid. Yeah. So I Wherever that rat scurried off to, hopefully someone finds him and hits him with a hockey stick, Scott Mellenby <laughs> style. I, I think that you're, you're spot on. I think Stan Bowman and Joel Quinville need to be given, a, like you said, a sentence or, Hey, you've paid your sentence. It's time. And it, it it's time to have both of those guys have opportunities to get back into the game. A hundred percent. They should, the but whether they will or not, even if they don't, this is my point. Even if you're saying that they're out forever, at least tell them that Let now. Them I think yeah. they deserve that. Yeah. Well, Frank, I mean, as someone who listened to the Cam and Strick pod with Joel Quinville, do you expect him to speak more on it? Because I feel like, you know, obviously those those questions were, you know, pretty tough questions to answer. But at the same breath, I don't know if it uncovered a lot. I, I kind of expected to hear a little bit more. Um, just curious on what you thought of that interview itself and the information that Joel spoke about. Um, Not to make this all about that, but you know what no, I mean? I, I, think I do think there's, I think part of him probably is, and and same thing with Stan Bowman, the, the reason why they've been quiet for so long is they don't want to try and make it seem like they're launching a media campaign and blitz. Yeah to get themselves back in because they feel like that's only going to hurt their case in the long run. So do I think we're going to learn more? Probably not. I, I honestly, having done my own reporting on the subject, I don't know that there is a lot more to learn. Mm -hmm. My understanding and, and belief is that Stan Bowman and Joel Quenville, the first time that they actually learned the gruesome details of what was alleged to have happened was when they read it in the Jenner and Block report. No one had come to them at any point previously and said Kyle Beach was being held at baseball bat and, you know, all these other things had happened. It was, at least is my understanding, hey, something weird may have happened between Kyle Beach and a player. Mm -hmm. And, or Kyle Beach and Brad Aldrich, Aldrich is, yeah, is Brad Aldrich. What, what he was told, excuse me. And that, at that point um, in the meeting is when, John McDonough, which we, who we just referenced, spoke up and said, hey, I got this. I'll handle this. I don't know about you guys, but when your president and CEO, who Colby, as you just referenced, is a dictator, says, I got this, maybe you could have asked some more questions. Maybe you could have followed up. But how much more were you really even expected to do, given the task at hand? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a fair question to ask. And I also yeah. think that our views and opinions have changed in 14 years of how seriously, not to say we didn't take it seriously in 2010, but it, it was a different time. And that's not an excuse. It's a reality. And I think this is a really, this is an uncomfortable conversation yeah. that yeah. needs to be had across well, many walks of life. Let me give you one more question. And then I do want to go back to Arizona because I feel mm -hmm. like I want to ask you certain questions about that situation that I, I need to hear clarity on from you, Frank, but this is from the chat and it's a very simple question from Alex K and, and I agree with it. Why is Bettman still punishing Quinville and Stan Bowman then? Like why, why are we in this, this sort of, um, no man's land, if if that's a, a good way to put it, with those two guys. And there is no clarity. And, you know, I've heard that both guys have met with him and they, they, they've they both expressed interest. They want to be back. I mean, I know Stan Bowman, a guy that, that I know a very long time. Like, 
he he the hockey is his life it's always been his life and he wants it to be his life again so what why are we why is Batman handling it this way it's a simple answer optics you don't want to make it seem as your sport is embroiled in another sexual abuse scandal with hockey Canada and the 2018 world junior team that's over here and over here is the Blackhawks thing and you don't want to make it seem like you're being easy on the Blackhawks thing while you're also taking the 2018 world junior scandal seriously so unfortunately for Quenville and Bowman they're kind of just wrapped up in the middle of that that until there's some clarity, the league doesn't really want to do anything. They don't want to make a statement one way or the other. And they're, I don't want to say they're happy. I think they are content to let them sort of sit here and wallow while all of that's playing itself out. And I think that's, it's unfair, but it's also life. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's the honest answer. Okay. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good answer too. I so, so let's 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 pivot back. I, we were in the middle of talking about Arizona and this move, and and th the way I understand this whole transaction, Frank, and I know it's been reported different ways. So is is the league buying the team and then flipping it to Ryan Smith, and then they're taking whatever that extra few hundred million is, they're dispersing it as a relocation fee? Is that is that correct? Yeah, so two separate transactions. The NHL is paying Coyotes owner Alex Marawello 100 or sorry, 1 billion dollars to relinquish the right to his franchise so they receive the franchise back from Arizona and then mm -hmm. the same day in a separate transaction they are placing and selling that franchise to Salt Lake City and and Ryan Smith of Smith Entertainment Group for 1.2 billion dollars and then the spread on those two things the 200 million dollars is going to be sprinkled among 29 owners Seattle and Vegas do not get a cut and that's going to be the relocation fee so it's not a perfect transaction by any means. I think there's certainly some NHL governors who feel like, you know, the price paid was too much because Alex Marowello purchased the Coyotes for $300 million five years ago. Wow. And through absolute incompetent ownership, regardless of however much he's pumped into the franchise through debt service and through cash calls, He's still walking away with a profit. And right. I think they're upset that that's the case. But another hard fact of life here, the NHL had to do what they did to, to move on from Alex Marowello. Now, here's the interesting part. Yeah, right? this is my next question. <laughs> yeah, is how does Alex Marowello get back in the club? And I believe that there is a an option to quote unquote reactivate the franchise in Arizona. He has a five year window of time, three to five years. And in the meantime, he must meet a whole slew of terms and conditions, including building the new arena and everything else probably has to remain in good standing and whatnot. And he has the option at that point to buy back in and get an expansion team and he's also retaining the rights to the Coyotes logo and colors and everything else, all the trademarks for $1 billion. So he's just giving it. So, so he's holding the billion and he's saying, okay, I'm going to go out and get what I could never get done, done. And then he's a, in, in theory, he would give the billion dollars back to, to restart the team in three to five years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's no guarantee that happens. Right. No. In fact, I would place serious odds against it happening just because it's a lot to pull off. You've right. got to privately fund a billion dollar build for a new arena district in in an expensive place to live. There might be better ways to spend that money. And but that's going to be a business calculation, but in the meantime, I would think the incentive for him it 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 cost Vegas 500, it costs Seattle 650 
only $1 billion five years from now seems like a pretty good deal for an NHL expansion team. That would be his incentive to get back in and get all of it done. So just to clarify, that team going back to Arizona would not be this current Utah team. It'd be a correct. It'd be a brand team, new a 33rd expansion team, team in the NHL. Correct. Jeez. Right. New staff, yeah. new, new draft, Everything. new expansion draft, all that. So then basically the NHL is using the guys on chicklets. They said, if, if Arizona gets a team back in expansion, are you going to leak all those picks too? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Probably. I said free um, tip, free tip to the NHL. This is advice for free. You're going to do an expansion draft again. Don't make your team submit their picks 24 hours at a time. Yeah. You're too good. That's, so, that's a long time in insider world. So, so here's a criticism we heard from, from Brian Burke yeah. um, on Toronto radio. I heard it. You heard it. Okay. So he said something along the lines of why are we leaving a market with 6 million people to go to a market with one and a half million people? Look, well, Brian Burke, I'll stop you. Cause I heard it. Brian Burke is, is a really intelligent guy. I don't know why he'd say something so stupid. Why are they leaving a city of 6 million people, the fifth largest in the United States? The answer is because they don't have a bleeping arena. <laughs> if they had an arena, this wouldn't be a problem. Okay, better question than why Utah? Because it's one of the fastest growing markets in the U.S. It's wealthy. And they've got an owner who's shown to be a capable steward of an NBA franchise literally frothing at the mouth mm -hmm. to run a first class team and build a new arena in a place that fits your geography. Well, yeah, from that, from that clip with Brian Burke, it seemed like he was basically getting at all the faith is simply in this new owner, Ryan Smith. It's not necessarily, he kind of, he kind of was like, why are we trusting this guy? I've seen yeah. this movie before, but think, but think about, hold on a second. We we've seen what movie before, what does that even mean? Like he, he it, there's a reason to trust this guy as you know the owner of this franchise because for two decades they've had absolute incompetent ownership. So we've got Alex Marowello. Uh, you can go through the timeline. The most recent owner before him was Andy Barraway, who was involved in uh, another arrest and sexual assault scandal, and didn't have the proper funding to be able to float the team and write the massive checks to fund it go through. Then before that they've had bankruptcy receivership, Jerry Moyes go the, go through the whole damn thing. The one reason why, well, two reasons why the arena is one. And the second one is they haven't had proper ownership. Do you think you this get a good has... owner? I don't care where you put the team. Look at the Tampa Bay lightning, Jeff Vinnick, a plus superstar yep. owner. Yep. The Tampa Bay Lightning have won two Stanley Cups and have been a model franchise for business and otherwise. It's true. That's true. And that was in a market that how long had Tampa Bay sagged? Yeah, they love that guy in Tampa and players love playing for him. And I guess was let me ask you this question, Frank. Obviously, there's a crazy vetting process, so you don't run into what happened with the Islanders all those years ago for the for these owners, right? Do you think that Ryan Smith had been pre-vetted out? Like they already oh knew they, but they did their due diligence and signed off months ago. Mo okay. So oh, so yeah. that's the, the time timeline. by the time he put out his statement uh asking for an NHL team in the same day, 23 minutes after the yeah, Hockey Canada nice. sexual assault dropped, you knew right then and there that he had not only worked in conjunction with the league, but had already been vetted and green lighted. So he wait, was already the seen... NHL's off ramp. Somebody in our Arizona. chat, TML says Tampa never sells out. I don't think that that's accurate. That's I think Tampa hot, hot, hot garbage. I think that Tampa sells out all the time. To be they honest, they do. Like I can tell their, you what their attendance is. Their crowds are unbelievable. I've I've been in a playoff series in Tampa before. Unbelievable. Even the Frozen Four in Tampa was unbelievable and sold out. So. I don't think that that's correct, TML. Um, I think it's Tampa sells out quite a bit. For Tampa, too, it's a place where a lot of uh, road teams love to go travel to see their team play. Do you know what Tampa's attendance was this season? What? Well, Frank, like, I saw you tweet something about it. 100% capacity. 19092 at Amelie Arena through all 41 home games. And 
their capacity is 190092. They literally did not have a single empty seat the entire season. And the NHL announced this morning, and I know Frank, Frank, you put this out there, yeah. record attendance in a league mm -hmm. that is heavily dependent on gate revenue. They had their biggest attendance year in the history of the league, which is probably why we're looking at six and a half or whatever billion dollars in revenue. A lot of that number comes from attendance. Yeah, it does. 97% capacity for the league this season. Now, there's a couple things that pump that up. You had the Global Series in Avicii Arena in Stockholm. You had uh, the Winter Classic at T-Mobile. You had the Outdoor Game, the Heritage Classic in Edmonton. Uh, you had the two games. Is it two games at MetLife? Two games, yeah. Yeah. I mean, 150,000 that, people on a weekend. That, that'll really help. But mm -hmm. they've still got... Here, here's the thing. They did set the attendance record, so the, the outdoor games help, but you also had 41 home, or 40 to this point, 40 home dates in Arizona at 4,500. Right. Yeah. So imagine had they played in a 17,000-seat arena, 12,000 times 41, the difference is, is pretty big. So um, look, this Coyote story, I think this is the win. It's a win-win-win. A, the NHL is getting out of Alex Marowello. B, uh, it's a win for Alex Marowello to profit uh, on his investment. C, it's a win to get this franchise into Ryan Smith's hands. D, Salt Lake City of the 413 metropolitan areas in the United States, Salt Lake City is the fourth fastest growing. And I'd say in a roundabout way, which is probably going to make your head spin, I think that mm -hmm. this is actually a win for hockey fans in Arizona. How is that possible, losing your team? The answer is because when they do come back, whether it's three years or five years, and whether it's with or without Alex Marowello, So you think it's inevitable? They're going to... Oh, it's 100%. The NHL is not leaving the Arizona for good. Okay. It's just... This is probably going to be a lot like the Minnesota Wild. You take the North Stars and you send them to Dallas, and six years later, five years later, you've got a new arena, and the franchise has been golden since. That is what the Arizona Coyotes are going to be the next time around. Strong ownership, beautiful new arena, hockey in the desert will be back. You're going to take a few steps back. It's going to be painful for the next few years to not have a team, but when it does come back, you're going to be in a way better place than you were before. Yeah. Vic just said, uh, said to us, right in time for Austin Matthews to be a UFA. <laughs> All right, Frank, my last question for you is a little bit of a hot seat question here. Um, you're obviously the president of the of the association, you know, for the writers. I know you you distribute um, and you help sort of pick the group that votes on end of season awards. Uh we've seen unprecedented types of scoring in the NHL, I mean, in a while. Um, you've got all these guys upwards of 130 points, Austin Matthews creeping around 70. If you're putting your ballot in tomorrow and Austin Matthews has 70 goals, but Nathan McKinnon and company have 50 plus, you know, 90 assists, you know, and they're at that 140 number where, where are you going with your, your MVP ballot or, or, you know, to, to, and you reserve the right to change your mind. But like, if Matthews hits 70, what does your ballot look like? I'd say he's probably fifth. Got it. Five. My thought process would be something. And, I, you know, obviously ballots are due on Friday. So I've been formulating this in my head for a while. Right now, my ballot probably looks something like Nikita Kucherov one. Nathan McKinnon, two. Artemi Panarin, three. Yes, Frank. Connor McDavid, four. And <laughs> Austin Matthews, five. And Alexi Lafreniere, six. <laughs> no, no yeah, I, John, I, I'm I, just going to write Johnny Lazarus, his favorite player. I I think it's so nice and refreshing, honestly, to hear you say Panarin. Like, I, like I you know, call me what you want. Obviously, and you're a, you're a Rangers fan and a homer, so yes. we get it. Um, yes. I, it's undeniable how important Panarin's been to the the President's Trophy winning team, mm -hmm. and, and that's really that what the award case, is. Right? It's most valuable to his team. How do you like? I love Nathan McKinnon's season. 
I think he gets extra style points because of the way that he does it. It's so fun to watch. But Nikita Kucherov is so far in front of everyone else on his team. I haven't, I didn't check today, but I think it was 53 points over the weekend. 53 um, points clear of his next closest teammate. Do you know that for a couple teams in the league, like 53 points puts you close to the team lead? I mean, that's the gap that we're talking about. And he's not, Nikita Kucherov is not going to bull you over on the rush the way Dalene that. led Buffalo with 59. <laughs> That you just made my point for me. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's that's how special Kucherov has been this year, and he's had an answer for everything that McKinnon has done. Everything. It just he he does it in a different way. He's sublime, and I look. I may flip flop. Something crazy happens. Maybe I go McKinnon one, Kucherov two. But I'm pretty firm in Panarin at three. Uh, McDavid and the hundred assists. That's going to be tough to deny. Uh, at four and Matthews has been great, but we also went at least the first two months of this season, definitively saying mm. Austin Matthews was not the MVP of the Toronto Maple Leafs. We were saying I was in Sweden. We were saying it was Willie Nylander. Yeah. 70 goals is a big number. It, it is. A it big it number. is. But well, McDavid had 64 last year and, and I don't hear anyone being like, Oh, well, you know, 64 is, is it's six more goals. Not I know, six, but for whatever reason in, in 80 games or whatever, like it's, in, it's insane. Why does, if it was 69, like you, you, you asked me the question, like I it's know. a magic trick tonight that if Austin Matthews scores, all of a sudden he should go higher on my ballot for whatever what does reason. That even mean? I, I have this mental, this mental block or this, this view of like, there's to me, there's a, such a big difference. If he's, if he finishes in the sixties versus hits that 70, that number 70 in 82 games, I, I, so you know, like, 50, even 50 plus even strength goals. And, and um, you know, you, there's only one goal for every two assists. So I just think goals have to be balanced a little bit differently. And, and that's, look, I don't vote. Um, I'm glad that I don't vote by the way. And, mm -hmm. and, but I, I just, I'm, I was curious where your head's at. Cause I, I know you do vote and I've asked this question to a number of people. Well, shit, on, like shit on my ballot. What part don't you like? What would you disagree it, it's with? It's hard to argue your ballot. I mean, I, you know, the thing is, is like, I, I'd probably put McKinnon above Kucherov. Um, because well, Kobe, do you take into account the position too, like center versus wing? Not really. No, no. I know I some people do. I don't, um, you know, but I, I, I look at the way that, you know, McKinnon had, I look at his split. I, I the fact that he's 50 plus goals and I, I look at the primary assists. I look at the even strength points and, and, you know, I kind of weight those things a little bit differently. I, I just, um, you know, to be fair, Johnny watches the Rangers every night. So when we started doing this show, I didn't watch the Rangers as much because he well, would you don't need to, because you'll just get an earful from him anyway. He was on the Rangers and I would have to watch all the other games those nights. So I, I, I probably don't have the, the, the right view of Panarin season, at least the second half of the season. Um, but I, I go back to 70 goals and I'm like, holy shit, 50 at even strength and 70 yeah. total it is, is just, it's remarkable. I mean, I see the hundred assists, but to me, 70 goals is, is a much heavier weight than, than a hundred assists. Okay. Because they can be second assists and second assists matter, but it's just not the same thing in my opinion. And so I probably would have Matthews further up the ballot, but would I have him one? Probably not. I probably, so would where have... would you put him? Well, Kobe, I think you the, can't I think say the 51... it without telling me where you're going to put him. I think the 51 even strength goals is the, is the most ridiculous part. Uh, I think so that's... what's more impressive though, and we can have this debate because the two yeah. of them are going to be close either way on my ballot. What's more impressive, the 100 assists or the the 70 goals if he gets there? 70 goals. Kobe and I are 70 goals. We're team 70, 70 goals. goals. So yeah. I, I agree, but I, I heard the Chicklets guys talking about this last week and they were like, it's got to be the 100 goals or 100 assists. It's only happened. He's now the fourth guy. Kucherov could be the fifth. It's Gretzky, Lemieux, and Orr. That's it. Yeah, but doesn't the fact that there are two guys possibly doing it this year make the 70 goals even more rare and more special? 
Like it's not there are two guys scoring I, I seventy. I just think scoring is the hardest thing to do in the league. I agree. So I always yeah. place a precedent on that, and I, you and know, only like one empty net goal. I think, if that. Well, there you could carve the stat two, two any which way goals. you want. You could, mm -hmm. uh, you could say, oh, Kucherov has fourteen even even uh, empty net points this season. That's a salary cap error record. No one has ever had fourteen even strength or. Can't get it out of my mouth. No one has ever had 14 empty net points in a season. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I think I, I probably would go McKinnon, Matthews, Kucherov is probably what I would do. Number one, two, three. And then Panarin would come in behind him at four. you you asked me what I would yeah, I don't, play. I don't think you're wrong either way. Honestly. And I, There's and I so think many good players this year. Yeah. Like I, I do think it, it's, it's very subjective this year. And I, I don't think like, I don't think it's going to be, 90% for one guy, 10%. Like, I think the numbers are going to be a lot closer this year on the ballots than probably we normally see. Yeah. It's the best Hart Trophy race that I've had voting Hart. in my 15 years as a voter. I, my The only point I wanted to make about Panarin was the President's Trophy. And to elevate right. your team to be the best team in the NHL. That's my year. that. That's why I have him three ahead of Matthew and weight. McDavid. Is yeah. he was head and shoulders above everyone else for the Rangers this year on the best team in the league. Yeah, should hold a little more weight. But Frank, I, I want to ask you. Um, you know, I, I don't want to keep you too long too, but just because your ballot's going in Friday, and we probably won't talk about it through the playoffs because it won't really be that relevant. But Jack Adams, I mean, it's a little bit. I, I feel like not as close now as it was when Torts was really in the mix um, for the Flyers to make the playoffs. But who it's would not be even, your... I don't even think it's close and I don't think it ever was close. Yeah, Rick Pocket your... took a Canucks team that was lost, mm -hmm. that was not close to the playoffs, added structure and is likely at least mathematically to win the Pacific division. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's they, everyone all year long for the Canucks waited for the dip. When are they going to fall apart? When are they going to regress? They had a couple bumps in the road, but they've been able to keep it together. And every time. They reeled it back in every time. Every time. Um, so to me, uh, uh, that's it's a clear cut. If, if Rick Tockett isn't winning the Jack Adams, to me, you might as well not hand it out anymore. There's a couple other great cases. I would say Spencer Carberry is... Yeah. Certainly deserving of consideration. John Tortorella kept the Flyers in it, but I think the way that the whole uh, Sean Couturier thing played out and how that team lost eight straight on the heels of that, uh, that to me is significantly or severely damaging to his case. Mm -hmm. um, Peter Laviolette deserves a lot of credit in New York. Um, that team plays, I think, differently than they did under Gerard Gallant. And... Their neutral zone looks world's difference, right, Johnny? And the way, yeah. that, I mean, it, it's it's so much more difficult to get through the blue lines against the Rangers than it was under Gallant. How do you, they're, they're still, how they're do still you, they're still pretty out? bad against the rush, but in a controlled setting, much better. The, sh the title of this is Morning Cup of Hockey, not Morning Cup of Rangers. I, I, I wasn't, I didn't even go deep. I kept it, I kept it very simple. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> you also can't count out Andrew Brunette. Yeah. So he he's going to be number two on your ballot. I don't vote for Jack Adams. Okay. Uh, Got it. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, look, when, yeah. when, so you, so ballots are due, you said on Friday of this week. Yep. Um, and they'll go to like what a, a firm to, to do all the calculations. Yep, they go to the NHL's uh, partner accounting firm and they tally it all up and we'll find out in June. Okay. All right. Well, look, good luck with your ballot this week. Sounds like you might have a busy day ahead now. I'll see you at uh, at noon uh, for DFO Live. I'll be riding with you on that all week here moving forward. Um, thanks for your time today. I know we, we, I mean, we always keep you long. I don't know why we pretend like we're not going to. Um, I think last week we kept it pretty it'll, short. It'll, it'll cost me a couple of Stephen Cookies dinners down the shore this summer, but yeah, I'm A-OK okay with that. Um, yeah. And uh, that's it. That's all we got for you today, Frank. Thank you. Well, Frank, I actually have one more question, if you don't mind. Just hang up, Frank. Just hang no, no, up. one more. Is he kidding? No, I'm, I'm dead up. serious. I'm dead serious. Frank, what do you think of Colby and the Color Salmon? Uh, it's a sponsor, and it's a great sweatshirt. We should get Frank some out west gear because he golfed. Yeah, I, I'd actually, that, that looks cool. Course. Give me, Give me one of those. Frank, I got to yeah. tell you, I did complain about the color of this. 
But then when I wore the blue one, I was like, oh, wow, this is so insanely comfortable that I'll wear the salmon, even though it's not my favorite I, color. I'm a fan of salmon. I've seen you wear salmon <laughs> I, before. I don't like the food, salmon, the fish, but I, I'm don't? a fan of the color. Yeah. All right. So Excuse thank you for asking him a dumb question before we wasted three more minutes of his time. Hey, you All right, go answer. Go answer. You've asked about my I dating. Know, I gotta ask him about your choice of clothing. I know your I know your phone is probably blowing up right now. So go go do your thing, Frank. I'll see you in uh, two hours on DFO Live. All right. See you guys. Thanks, all Frank. right. I had to sneak that one in there. What are you all mad at me? No, it's all right. You made a face. Because you're an idiot. <laughs> you know, this is what it is. But, but I'm so. your idiot. I'm your idiot. Right? It's true. Yeah, I'm stuck with you. You're right. All right. Let's yeah. look at tonight's yeah, games. Totally um, yeah. You know, that was uh, that was is that the first time like mid sentence this season? We were literally mid sentence. I feel like teams wait till we get off the air at 10 05 to break their news. Um, but no, we, it, yeah, it, we had to take a line of news that one time. It, it was. Uh, there was there's there was definitely buzz like and i wonder if the reason buffalo did it today like they could have just waited another what day or two is buffalo has one more game left correct uh, uh no i think did, they, they, done. did, I think did done. they hit 82 i think 82 was last night for them let me just double check yeah so they hit 82 last night they wouldn't they fire their coach with one game left well, that's what I was like, really? Yeah, yeah. So they, yeah. they, they just move quickly, which means they can probably get ahead of things. But, you know, you think maybe unless they have somebody they've already identified, maybe they want to wait till the first round of the playoffs are, are over because there could be other candidates available after the first round of the playoffs. Um, mm -hmm. Colby is the one who chose to wear pink. It's not pink. It's salmon um, for the record. <laughs> uh, <laughs> for yeah, we're, the we're getting some comments on that. <laughs> people love this shit yeah. all right let's look at tonight johnny let's yeah. let's look at our betway bet of the day let's start with that um because it is the last night of the regular season so we got to shout out not. our partners Tomorrow. at Tomorrow Thursday. still running um still running this great promotion with a free 200 dollars bet if your first bet loses um you can bet however much you want but it'll they'll give you back up to $200 on that bet. The way you can get in on the action, scan the QR code on your screen, create a new account. That will automatically uh, load you up to get reimbursed if that first bet doesn't hit. I like to parlay. I like to give my chance to go big or go home. That's kind of how I bet on things. So make sure you take advantage of this opportunity from Betway, available only outside of Ontario. As always, bet responsibly. That's all we ask. Have fun. But don't be an idiot. Um, don't be like Johnny Lazarus. What we're looking at tonight, okay, is a juicy plus 120 Washington money line, okay? Do or die here for both of these teams. Um, I guess there is scenario. Is there scenarios if Washington loses where they can still get in? Um, Washington clinches with a win of any kind against Philly. Uh, if Washington, Detroit. Yeah, so, I mean, look. Go, go big or go home tonight with for the Washington Capitals. Both of these teams need the two points uh, to have any chance to get in. Washington controls their own destiny. Philadelphia think, Flyers do not. I think the only way Washington can lose and get in is if it's an overtime. Well, I'm if pretty... everybody else loses and they lose in overtime, right? Yes, So but... they get a point, but everybody else loses. And you don't want to... But, wanna... but, but Philly, Philly owns the tiebreaker if Philly wins in regulation. Right, but Philly also needs um, – they also need a bunch of other situations. So let's see. Yeah. Philly clinches with a regulation win against Washington, a Detroit loss, and a Pittsburgh loss in regulation. So mm. a lot of dominoes have to fall for the Flyers to get in. Yeah. I don't see it happening. I just don't. They may win, but I don't think they're going to get the help that they need. Um, and I like plus 120 for Washington, do or die, Alexander Ovechkin. I mean, it's basically <laughs> game seven. I, I, I think I think I'm 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 rolling with the caps there. And plus money, I, I like the fact that it's plus money. We're Relax. getting some comments on 200. It's not responsible. <laughs> in, in 200 isn't responsible. dollars is not responsible. Well, but it's a free $200. Yeah, you get it back. You get it back. Yeah. We'll see um, what Betway brings us for the playoffs. Maybe they're going to change it up. Maybe they're going to offer us a different promotion, but get involved. We couldn't do this without our sponsors, whether it's Betway, whether it's ProRasso, whether it's Out West. 
These guys all have our backs. Uh, so we continue to try to have their backs. So Johnny, other than Washington, Philly, what are you thinking about the outcomes of some of these other games? Obviously Detroit, Montreal could, mm -hmm. could potentially be must see TV, right? I mean, I, I'm going to have those two games on. I'll have, I'll probably have Philly, Washington on, on my big screen and Detroit, Montreal on my computer. Um, tonight is a big make a steak, have a glass of red wine, watch some hockey night, enjoy the hockey. Uh, we're not going to get anything like this the rest of the week. Um, but those are the two games I'll be watching. Then I'll have probably Toronto and Florida on the screen as well, trying to see Austin Matthews get 70. Um, but as far as that goes, like there, there's no other game that really interests me. I mean, Carolina's locked into the second spot in the Metro, uh, Seattle versus Winnipeg. Winnipeg can clinch home ice, but I probably won't really tune into that game just with all the other um, implications going on. And um, I mean, Vegas still needs to Vegas, win. Chicago. Yeah. I mean, Vegas has got to win games. Like they, they still can, can move around. And that's the thing. The about West the is West. just, the West is just so uninteresting right we, now with everything going on in the East. Yeah. We know who's in, but now yeah. they're kind of playing for matchups. And then I look at Boston and Ottawa, like, does Boston rest some guys tonight in, in hopes of potentially losing and, and hope for a Florida win? Like I would think Boston would rather have the Toronto Maple Leafs. Although when you look at, you know, look, Tampa's been better, right? The last couple of months, but they, they haven't been great this year. I mean, their goal differential differential is <laughs> not as good. Uh, Sergachev's not back. They're not deep on the back end. I mean, I know we love Tampa, Mm -hmm. Um, but like over seven games, like I, I worry about their back end, even with Hedman. I, I just, he can't, he can't play 50 minutes, right? You know, there's, there's half a game where Hedman's not, Hedman's not on the ice. So, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see what, what Boston does going into tonight, as far as who they play and, and what they're looking for. They just got to put Shaq and Kirk as the QB on PP one. They did. They did that <laughs> yeah. last night. Yeah. Um, you know, they finally went to that. that they finally went to that. I mean, I've been saying that for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, I've been tweeting that for a couple of weeks. I mean, their director of of, of analytics uh, follows me on Twitter, the Bruins. So maybe you think that went right to maybe to, he uh, saw what I said and he went Monty? right to Monty. Um, you know, I I uh, I might have dropped that line in David Carl's ear this week as well when we were at the Frozen Four, hoping he would he would send it to Monty. So I'm just. I'm I'm doing everything I can, shoot shooting shots across the bow. Maybe I'll just text Monty directly and be like, "Hey, it's about time you listen to me." The morning cup of hockey voice spreads, man. We got people on the Lafreniere hundred point train. Stephen Ellis mentioned it the other day. You got Shattenkirk as the quarterback on PP one. Um, apparently, Shatty had seven hits last night. He's looking for a game. spot in the playoffs. Yeah. He, want, he he wants to play in the playoffs, but. Uh, before we wrap it up, Colby, because there is a potential scenario where the Flyers and Capitals have like every tiebreaker. Can you read? I know you have it in front of you. Can you read off the tiebreaker list again, just for people that aren't sure? Because yeah. if the Capitals do win in regulation, it makes things very, very interesting as far as the tiebreaker goes. So well, but be, the cap, the, put, put this, Vic, give us the Eastern Conference standings really quickly. They'd be, they'd be tied in regulation wins. They'd be tied in regulation overtime wins. Yeah, so so Washington has 89 points. The Flyers have 87 points. So mm -hmm. if the Flyers win in yeah, regulation. I meant Flyers. If yeah, yeah. the Flyers win in regulation and get to 89 points, okay? And um, so... The Flyers win in regulation and they get to 89 points and they end up in a tiebreaker against the Washington Capitals. It would go to the sixth tiebreaker, okay, in order to sort out who gets into the into the playoffs. It starts with regulation wins, which they would be tied, okay? Regulation and overtime wins, which they would be tied. Total wins, tied. Most points earned in games between tied teams. They would be even on that uh, regulation time goal difference. Okay. Regulation time goal difference is five. And then six regulation and overtime goal differential. So people have broken this down on the internet and basically showed the fact that they get to the fifth and sixth tiebreaker. If these two teams add up, end up in a deadlock. Um, mm -hmm. And I believe it goes to the Flyers, correct? Um, well, I, is there any head-to-head -head as well or no? 
Yeah, most points earned in teams in in games between tied teams. Yeah, so 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 That's far head to head. Head to head this year. Well, uh each team has won one game, but the Caps lost in a shootout. So the Caps have five? No. Four? Three? Three? Three points? And the Flyers well, get, have two. Yeah. You, you you get two points. Yeah. Caps have three. Flyers have two as far as the points go between teams. So the regulation would make it four or three in favor of the Flyers. Exactly. Yes. So it, it, it'll get into it. And, and depending on what happens with Detroit, they fall into that same thing. Um, And you look, but their regulation wins are only Much 27, yeah. where Washington has 31 regulation wins and the Flyers would get to 31 regulation wins. But that's only if Detroit loses, obviously. If right. They win, if, it's different. Then they're, 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 in, they're in good shape because they can yeah. get to 91. The Flyers but, can only get to 89. Detroit can get to 91. Washington can get to 91. Pittsburgh can only get to 90. So we should see, though, you know, if this game's tied late in the third, like Tortorella is pulling the goalie. You know, they're going for the regulation win. They have to. Well, they have to. They have to. They have so to. They have that, to. that's the game to watch for sure. And, uh, man, it's going to be it's going to be one hell of a night. And if you're on the East Coast, I think it's going to be like 80 degrees today. It's beautiful outside my window right now. I can't wait to throw on my rollerblades this afternoon and go for a, a good skate down the West Side Highway. But uh, don't, don't eight, fall. But I don't You're fall. Come in with like a huge scrape on the side of your face tomorrow. I'm a roller guy. Any final thoughts before we wrap it up on today's show? That's all I got, Johnny boy. All right. Going to be a fun night. Really excited. Thanks to everyone in the chat for getting involved today. Thank you to our producer, Vic. And we'll see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. with hopefully some playoff updates. What's up, hockey fans? If you enjoyed that video, then you need to be hitting the subscribe button right here at Daily Faceoff. Exclusive interviews and analysis from our hockey insider, Frank Saravalli, fantasy updates from Brock Sagan, and a daily live show at noon Eastern, Monday through Friday. You don't want to miss any of the fantasy.